Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 8th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three are these. First, we discuss the coming week and where we are likely to be by this time next week. Second, we discuss the huge inconsistency in the economic arguments some are making. They are concerned about state jobs, except when they have to help pay for them, then they aren't. And third, an important discussion last week between Senators Schauer and Keel previews the next phase of the fiscal debate. And now, let's join Michael. Let's take a crack at the uh, at the weekly top three. This morning, we're going to start off with uh, a discussion that that you and I were having, and that you you threw me some uh, you threw me some stats on. Um, and I was just mentioning Lyman Hoffman, who is now the new Senate Majority Leader, as we watch the Senate Majority fracture apart. Um, he is uh, saying that he wants to add the PFD formula to the Constitution to remove this political football from the field. Yeah, there was a, a great interview uh, with Lyman and the local public uh, uh, public radio station uh, in Bethel uh, uh, in the week, and it was published. It was published yesterday uh, on KYUK's uh, website, um, and it's a really insightful uh, uh, interview. Whether you agree with Lyman or not, you have to recognize he's been there for a long time. He's seen a lot of of changes in the legislature, been part of most of them, um, always seems to land on his feet, always seems to land in the majority, and really has, uh, I think, a, a again, what, with him or not, really has a good feel for, for what the legislature is up to. And, and I thought it was a very insightful interview um, containing a lot of insight, not, not, not inciting your riot, but containing a lot of insight, uh, an insightful interview with, with Lyman. That, that really, I think, put, a, uh, a, 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 it put this thing in perspective. To me, the question really is, where are we in a week? I mean, we've got a hard week ahead of us. We've got the veto overrides. We've got a bill now in both the, at least the Juno branch of the legislature, the Juno faction of the legislature for a $1,600 PFD that had a hearing yesterday on the House side and, and, and will likely go through the House and, and, uh, and, and come over to the Senate. Um, and to me, the question is really, where are we going to be in a week? Are we going to be, are we going to advance the ball or are we just going to sort of be spinning in circles? And Lyman's, the interview with Lyman really was, was sort of the, the answer was sort of the latter. Uh, in, in a way, we're going to be spinning, spinning in circles. The first question was, where are we going to be on the vetoes? Lyman was fairly clear in counting noses and said he thinks that he thinks he doesn't think the vetoes are overridden, that, that, the, vetoes, that the vetoes are upheld. Uh, and, and the legislature has since scheduled a vote on Wednesday to, to consider that, and, and I don't think the count's any different than when Lyman, uh, when Lyman did the interview. And then the second question is, where are we going to be on the PFD? And, and, and Lyman's answer to that was the Senate, the House and the Senate, uh, the, at least the Juno factions of both, will likely pass a $1,600 PFD. It will go to the governor. The governor will veto it. And he said, we're going to be right back where we started uh, on the PFD. And frankly, there's another uh, piece of this puzzle. Lance Pruitt was, clo- was quoted in, uh, in an ADN article uh, uh, earlier in the week uh, about talking about where we're going to be 
sort of down the road. And and Pruitt was quoted as saying this. Pruitt, Pruitt said that if the lawmakers agree to pay a traditional dividend this year, agreement on a capital budget will soon follow, and that budget could include the reversal of some of the governor's vetoes. Right. So even even that is saying that that the veto override is not going to be the last word on this issue. Right. That we may be headed we may be headed yet to to even more going down the road on spending. So basically the answer the answer is at the end of this week or or where where are we going to be next week? We're going to have gone through some motions in these two different factions of the legislature. Uh, there's going to be have been some votes, but it's not going to have resolved anything. Uh, and we're going to be right back where we started uh, in about a week's time. Well, and I and I think that's the that's the big challenge here. And when I saw that from Pruitt, I just kind of bristled a little bit because I mean I understand that there's a lot of pressure on the legislature right now and on legislators who are holding the line uh, that you know why do they hate children and old people and puppies and everything else because they're supporting the. Uh, governor's veto override but when i did see that from pruitt i thought "Mm, man that is such a slippery slope because we could again this is i mean that's how we got to this place that's how we got to this position where we are overspending because of these end of the year last minute compromises that we've continued to see build this budget up to the level that it is right now you know i exactly right i I think that's a it's a horrible outcome to say that we're gonna that that we're gonna reverse some of these vetoes. We're going to vote to uphold the vetoes and then potentially reverse some of these vetoes uh, in the capital budget. I think that's a horrible outcome. We, even with the Dunleavy budget, even with the Dunleavy uh, uh, vetoes, we've still got $600 million deficit. Um, e- even after, uh, even if all the governor's vetoes are upheld and no additional changes are, are made, we've still got a $600 plus million dollar deficit. And, and and to say that, that now we're going to go into the capital budget and we're going to reverse some of those vetoes and add spending back in, that that's just we're, we're just we're, we, not only is it a slippery slope, it's 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 falling it falling over the cliff. I mean, we've got a deficit. All we've had a huge deficit. We're going to have a continuing deficit even after the governor's vetoes, and now we're going to make that deficit worse again uh, by reversing some of. Uh, some some of the spending cuts potentially reversing some of the spending cuts uh, in the capital budget. I mean, one response to that that I saw was, well, the governor can veto those again um, in the in the uh, in the capital budget, but but if the House Republicans, I mean, if this, this is Lance Pruitt, the, the the head of the of the House Republicans, if the House Republicans vote for some of these some of these reversals in the capital budget, then unlikely that we're going to reverse that, that the governor is going to veto them and unlikely that even if he does that they're going to be that those are going to be upheld on veto so we're just we're continuing to go down the hole uh down, down the rabbit hole and and while and while we hope that we might get some resolution with that this week we're really not it doesn't appear we're going to right it appears that we're just going to continue keep on keep on going down this hole he got a little esoteric in this interview, which I thought was interesting, and he talked about his brainchild, his baby, which, of course, is the Power Cost Equalization Fund, which had the money swept out of it at the end of the fiscal year on June 30. Um, and that was nearly a billion dollars that got swept into the CBR. They don't have enough money to – they don't have enough votes to uh, to sweep, to do the reverse sweep, to pull that money back out. Um, is that something we should be watching for? Oh, absolutely. There's going to be a lot of horse trading I mean, and, and Lance has opened the door. His comment about doing some of this in the capital budget just opens the door. There's going to be a lot of horse trading going on around uh, the PFD. And Lyman's got, I mean, we're going to go right back into the situation that we've talked about before, that each of the 60 have something they want. And, and, and Lyman's a master at this horse trading. So what he wants is he wants his PCE back, something that he – and Donnie Olson and some others have worked very hard on over the years to store this money away in the Power Cost Equalization Fund, um, and 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 that's that's going to be what he wants in the trade to 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 get his three thousand dollars. He said in the in the article he wanted to talk to the governor about it. That's clearly the direction he's going. Every legislator will have something that they want out of the deal, and if we go back into this horse trading as part of the capital budget. It's really not certain where this is going to end. 
The big question is, and of course the headline of the article reads that uh, Lyman Hoffman wants to add the PFD to the Constitution, um, and that the big question is because it is the, I mean, it is the fl- the football in the room. It's what's caused all this debate to begin with was the question of whether or not they should follow the law on the PFD. So Lyman says he apparently wants the PFD in the Constitution. What uh, what are the chances now of that actually happening now that you're seeing some, you know, bipartisan, you know, kind of push for it? I, th- I think on the philosophical question of do you want the PFD in the Constitution, the vote's probably 80 percent yes, what they, what the legislators want in the Constitution, 20 percent no, John Coghill's one of the 20 percent, but, but I think it's a I think it's a fairly broad majority. The, 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 the question is, what specific provisions do you want to put in the Constitution? And they're all over the, 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 the bench on that. So until you get agreement on what it is you want to put in the Constitution, it's nice to ask the question of whether you want something in the Constitution, but you have to reach agreement on what you want in the Constitution, and I think they're a far distance from that. In the third segment, we're going to talk about a, a conversation that, that Mike Shower and Jesse Keel had on public radio uh, last week on Talk of Alaska that I think is a very important conversation, and if listeners haven't listened to it, they should. Um, and I think that may give us a clue of where this is heading. But but right now, I don't think there's a consensus for what they would put in the Constitution, and without that, there's no there, there's going to be no agreement on putting on, on putting it into the Constitution. So let's put number one to bed. Let's talk a little bit about number two, which was Chuck Copps cop out it was his 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 article in the adn which again just made blood shoot out of my eyes um what was what was your thoughts on the commentary from chuck cop oh uh, this is this is chuck cop represents like the third most wealthy district legislative district uh or at least representative district in the state and this is typical tw- top 20 percent stuff it's like we need to have we need to have government spending uh, but but the top twenty percent top twenty percent don't want to pay for it, and so they want to push it off in terms of PFD cuts, and so we and 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 we need to cut the PFD to pay for this government spending. We have to save Alaska. We have to save the university. We have to save these jobs. Uh, we have to save uh, this sort of future for Alaska. But I don't. But but my constituents don't want to pay for it. So we need to find some other dumping ground for all of these costs. PFD cuts will do it, um, and so we just need to we need to have PFD cuts and push these costs off on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. It's the same thing you hear out of Giesel. It's the same thing you hear out of Von Imhoff. It's the same. It's, it's the same thing you, you hear out of Cop. And it's just a it's a it, it's a it's really a, a a dishonest approach. It's a we need to save Alaska, but I don't want to pay for it. Right. I want somebody else to pay. For well, it. and the, the- and it's just I mean. It's, the just the tone of his article of how how selfish you all are for not wanting to give up your PFD. How selfish you all are for saying it's mine and I want it all. And don't you know you have to pay for your government? Don't you know that you should you know that you've avoided paying thus far? Which again is just as disingenuous as it could possibly be, considering the amount of revenue that the state receives directly with no input from the citizens. Uh, I mean, it's 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 the picture of disingenuousness. It is, and, and it's the and it's the top twenty percent approach to how to resolve this issue. Let's keep spending. Let's keep all of those jobs that some of us have, and others of us in the top twenty percent earn our living off of through gov- by government contracts. Let's keep spending, but we don't want to pay for it. Let's find somebody else uh, to push it off on. And as long as they keep that up. Uh, we're, we're just not going to get any place because it's a hugely disingenuous, hugely dishonest, um, and, 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 and sort of revolting uh, approach to the issue. Once, once we all get in this, once, we, once we're all going to pay for it, I think we're going to find a solution. I think we're going to find the balance between what we want, which is spending, and what we're willing to pay, which is revenues. But as long as we keep up this top 20 percent pushing it off on somebody else, uh, it, we're just not going to find a solution to that. Uh, Brad, did you see the uh, article uh, where Muchin Gutabi spoke to the uh, – it was either the Chamber or the Anchorage Economic Development Corp. I can't remember which one um, – where he was talking about all oh, these cuts are going to lead to a recession. 
Um, but, uh, you know, it, I mean, that was the headline. I, I don't think he necessarily phrased it quite that, that uh, direly. But um, did you happen to see that article and get a chance to read it? No, oh, yeah, I, I read the article, and I and and there's a paper that that Musine and 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 uh, somebody else from the university have have done, ten page paper that was sort of summarized what they did in the speech, uh, and I've read the paper also. Um, it, it is it is. I mean, I hate to say this, but it it is what you what what you hear from the university basically is we want to save our jobs. And we really don't care what the what the economic impact is on anybody else. We just just save our jobs, um, and, and and maybe we can talk about this when we come out of the break because I think it's I think it's deserving of a of a broader discussion. Ed King had a great had sort of a great uh, response to that. Uh, the the Musin's talking about with the potential loss of four thousand jobs. He has in fact he did in fact make the claim that it would throw us back into a recession. Ed came out with a chart uh, that that looked at total Alaska jobs, which is somewhere in excess of 400,000 jobs, uh, uh, total jobs in Alaska. And he said, you know, jobs jobs at risk by the um, uh, it was a it was a circle chart, uh, a pie chart, jobs at risk uh, as a result of vetoes, one percent, jobs untouched by vetoes, 99 percent. So. I mean, Musin is, is trying to make a big uh, a, a big play out of these job cuts because, frankly, he's concerned his is one of them. Uh, trying to make a big play out of these job cuts, but in the in the in the in the big scheme of things, it's really a very trivial matter uh, in terms of its impact on on total Alaska jobs and the overall Alaska economy. Their calculations also don't take into effect into account. Uh, the, the, the 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 offset, it, it, it the, the offset impact it would it, that would result from funding those jobs. If you use PFD cuts, for example, uh, to fund those jobs, it's going to have an adverse impact on overall jobs. You're going to be taking jobs out of the economy. Right. <clears throat> and they didn't offset the four thousand with uh, with those jobs. So it's a it, it's a it's an interesting piece. It's consistent with pieces of what. Uh, of what ICER has said, but what Messina said before, what ICER has said before, uh, but it's a very incomplete piece and, frankly, a very one-sided piece, and a, and a piece that really loses perspective uh, in terms of impact on the overall economy. Well, because nothing happens in a vacuum. I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, in previous speeches, he's talked about how a cutting of the PFD would eliminate nine thousand jobs. And so if I've got a balance scale and I'm saying 4,000 jobs versus 9,000 jobs, I mean, just at a cursory glance, that seems like that's, you know, equitable. But again, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum. We're not talking about he doesn't talk about the other side. He only talks about, as you said, the impact on potentially his employment, not the rest of the employment in the private sector. Yeah, it's um, I, I, I mean the the nine thousand jobs came from frankly a different level of budget cut. So you have to get apples to apples, and there there is no question, even when you do apples to apples, uh, there is going to be some job loss uh, in the state from these budget cuts. That that pay, uh, maintaining the PFD um, uh, in lieu of of using that money to pay for government is going to result uh, in some job loss. The PFDs retaining the PFD doesn't offset uh, the amount of job loss that, that's going to occur from from cutting government. But, you know, so – but that argument basically is take all the PFD because you generate more jobs. Take all the PFD and throw it into the university uh, because you would, you would generate more jobs. Heck, take all the PFD and start taxes and throw that into the university because you, you, you would create more jobs. There is a balance uh, that has to be struck out there. Uh, between how much you're going to how much you're going to take out of the private sector and put into the public sector, um, and and the balance that the governor Hammond struck and the balance that we've had since 1980 is 50 percent to the PFD, 50 50 percent to the citizens of the state, 50 percent to, uh, to to government, uh, and now government uh, you know government spent all of its 50 percent and now it wants more. So you, you've got to you've got to strike a balance someplace. You can't base all this 
uh, on the outcome of jobs because by the logic of that argument, you just take everything out of the private sector. <clears throat> you keep taking money out of the private sector and throwing it into into the public sector and keep putting it keep putting it at jobs. There's got to be yep. a balance. Yep. And I think I think Ed's Ed's perspective on that was the right one. Continuing now with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. We were talking about our number two of our weekly top three, which was the opinion piece from Chuck Kopp. Um, any final thoughts on that, Brad, before we uh, sidebar for a minute on the Musin Gutabi thing? Well, I think a transition to the to the to the conversation about Musin's uh, uh, piece is is Cop's emphasis on a uh, part of his emphasis is on jobs that we've got it that we've got to save jobs. So we've got to, uh, jobs at the university and jobs elsewhere in government. So we've got to cut the PFD uh, in order to have money to to fund these jobs over in government. Cop really becomes disingenuous in that portion of the argument because the ICER analysis consistently, not only the one in 2016, but the ones before that uh, and the ones, frankly, they've done since, the ICER analysis consistently has been you lose the most jobs out of cutting the PFD uh, in terms of raising revenue, that other forms of taxes, sales taxes, income taxes, property taxes – uh, all have an impact, an adverse impact, but you don't lose as many jobs out of those forms of generating revenue as you do out of cutting the PFD. So what COP says is it's important. It's important to, to keep these government jobs. It's important to, to keep money going to the government because it's important to keep these jobs. Then when he shifts over and talks about how do you raise revenue to keep those jobs, all of a sudden, evidently, jobs don't matter anymore. Because he's leaping to PFD cuts, which have the, quote, largest adverse impact on the overall economy in terms of job loss uh, and in terms of income loss of all of the of all of the revenue options. So he's 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 saying we need to keep these jobs. We need to keep these jobs. Uh, It's important to keep these jobs. We need revenue to keep these jobs. But once we get over to the revenue side, he's completely discarding the jobs effect and, and talking about. You know, frankly, what avoids the top 20 percent, the, the way of raising revenue that avoids the top 20 percent, which is to take the job, take uh, money from uh, middle and lower income Alaskans. Uh, the, the title of Cop's article uh, is, is, as he titled it, is The Fight to Save Alaska. Really, the title of that article ought to be The Fight to Save the Top 20 percent right. from, from paying. Well, that... uh, uh, because that's uh, the, the, the consistent theme. Of, of that piece is not to save Alaska jobs. It's not to save Alaska spending. The consistent theme of that article, the only consistent theme of that article is save the 20, top 20 percent from paying uh, for Alaska government. Right. And that ties back into Mutin Gutabi, who spoke to the, uh, I think it was Anchorage Economic Development Corp uh, at a luncheon where he said basically that uh, Dunleavy's vetoes could put us back in a recession because of the amount of job losses focusing on the university. But again, he neglects to take into account any of the job losses that would factor in with the loss of a PFD. Exactly right. There, there's no question that if you take money out of the university, the university is going to have to lay off some people uh, and there's going to be job losses. There's no question that that's going to have so, uh, uh, something of a spill down effect. Uh, a trickle down effect uh, elsewhere because there won't be the the university uh, uh, won't have the jobs at the same income level they won't be spending as much at least for a while so there will be some some trickle down effect no question about that but there's also there's also the effect of where you get the money from uh, and and the effect that has on the economy so if you pull uh, money out of the PFD if you cut the PFD to to spend over in the university you're going to have job losses from uh, from where that from that where that PFD money would otherwise go. Now, Musin has taken over the last year or so, as we've gotten into this battle, to try to trivialize uh, the jobs coming from the PFD. He characterizes them uh, both uh, both previously and in the speech and in the paper that that was released yesterday as 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 uh, temporary uh, seasonal jobs arising from the October. Uh, arising from the October distribution. No one's sure that's really the way it works. I mean, there are a lot of people who think what really happens with the PFD, with a large segment of the PFD, is people pay down credit card bills or pay off, pay off bills 
that had been incurred over the prior 12 months. Well, the spending that went on through the credit card uh, or through other means through the prior 12 months generated jobs during that during that 12 month period. Um, no one's because because of, of data insufficiency, nobody's really been able to trace exactly where, what those PFD payments are doing. So to assume that they only are generating trivial, uh, uh, temporary, uh, seasonal jobs may, in fact, is just an assumption and may, in fact, very well be the, be the wrong assumption. So the, the previous ISA reports have said there are job losses associated with cutting the PFD. Those job losses are bigger than the job losses that would result from sales taxes, uh, income taxes, or property taxes. They are, in fact, have the largest cutting the PFD, in fact, has the largest adverse impact in terms of job losses and in terms of income losses uh, of any of the new revenue options. Uh, and we've seen, and, 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 the, and the report they released yesterday uh, just doesn't take that into account. It, 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 he, he, when asked about it, he trivializes uh, the job loss on the PFD side and just doesn't take it into account. In any event, if you were going to be rigorous, <coughs> If you were going to be rigorous about this jobs issue, what you would do is say, okay, we're worried about jobs, so we need revenue to come over to the to the state side, uh, the public side, so we can spend money on the university and maintain jobs there. Now, where are we going to get that revenue? What produces the fewest job losses? Because we're concerned about jobs. What produces the fewest job losses? And that's where we ought to be talking about uh, picking up the revenue. But they don't do that. They, they focus on the job losses on the public sector side, and then they just sort of forget about that issue. Chuck Kopp forgets about that issue. Musine forgets about that issue when they come over to, to the revenue side and where this revenue is going to be raised. It's a really – it's a very um, inconsistent, self-serving, uh, transparent uh, effort to try to argue for the importance of the university but without doing a rigorous analysis of where of what the real impact is going to be on the overall economy from that. And then, the, the other thing that needs to be. Oh, I was just going to say, Ed King had his uh, his pie chart that you told us uh, that that showed the effect of the job losses on the state as an overall whole. I thought that was pretty uh, pretty eye opening. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going. Ed, Ed does a, a does a significant job, an important job, of sort of putting these job losses in context. Alaska has over four hundred thousand jobs. Um, so Ed did a pie chart that showed uh, that divided uh, the number of jobs affected by uh, the potential losses from these from these vetoes against the Alaska overall overall job market, and and the pie chart's just just fascinating. I mean, the pie chart he uses orange for the, or at least on my slides, uses orange for the the total number of Alaska jobs unaffected by the PFD or by these by these uh, vetoes. And then the sliver uh, that's affected, or yellow for the sliver that is affected by the by the vetoes, and it's 99 to one, right? The the vetoes affect one percent of Alaska jobs. Ninety nine percent of Alaska jobs are unaffected. So you really have to yeah you have to put this in context. I mean, Musine obviously coming from the university is trying to blow uh, this the impact into the biggest number he can, into the biggest impact he can. But in doing so, he's he's losing a sense of proportion. He's losing a sense of proportion about what the what the real impact on the overall Alaska job markets is, one percent, and he's losing perspective on what the on what the net impact on the Alaska jobs market is by ignoring the impact coming from the revenue side. Well, we've uh, we've nearly run the clock out here. We got less than two minutes. Can you summate the the third topic, and uh, maybe we could take it over the top of the break here. Yeah, there there was a discussion um, uh, last week on Talk of Alaska, which is the public media, one of the public media talk shows, uh, uh, and it's the podcast is available on the public media Alaska public media website. I commend it to anybody who hasn't listened to it. It's a conversation between Mike Shower, uh, Senator Mike Shower, and Senator Jesse Keel, probably one of the most conservative, fiscally conservative, and one of the most fiscally liberal. Uh, uh, senators uh, uh, each uh, in the Senate. I think it's a huge insight into where we're headed on this issue and where we may find uh, the solution. Basically, it was supposed to be about the PFD, but, but, but basically it put the PFD in the context of 
the PFD is one option for raising revenue, and it ha has a lot of downside. And so the conversation was sort of evolved into more, how are we going to raise revenue, which is the real question. What's the right way to raise revenue if we're going to have to raise revenue? Um, uh, not just focused on the PFD, not just assuming that's the right answer from the outset. Again, if, if people haven't, anyone who's listening who hasn't listened to that conversation, I think will benefit from going back and listening to the podcast because I think it's a I think it's a roadmap on where this con where this conversation about fiscal policy right. hits next. Right in the break right now, Brad Keithley continues with us for just a few more moments here. You want to expound on any of that, Brad? Yeah, I, I think the I think the the conversation between Senator Shower and Senator Keel was very uh, professional. Was was no name calling, no no you know trying to slip in uh, you know quick uh, uh, quick uh, sound bites. Uh, I, it was a very good conversation, and I think and 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 I truly think it's a conversation that we're going to evolve into. It's a conversation that many wish we would have had over the last. You know, seven years as we've been running these deficits, uh, many w wish we would have had during the course of this last legislative session. Uh, and, and maybe it's a conversation we still won't get to for yet another year or two years or three years. But it's a, it's a conversation that really focuses on the core issue. We've got a deficit, as you and I have discussed, even after the governor's vetoes, we still have a, a more than $600 million uh, deficit in this state. We've got a deficit. And if we can't get spending down to cover the deficit, and frankly, even the governor hasn't been able to do that, if we can't get spending down to, to close the deficit, we're going to have to have revenue from somewhere. It's either going to come from current Alaskans uh, in terms of some form of taxes on current Alaskans, or it's going to come from future Alaskans in terms of spending savings and reducing the investment base that will generate earnings for future Alaskans. Both Senators Keel and Shower, I think, quickly dismissed kicking the can down the road and imposing this burden, imposing the mistakes of this generation on future generations. I think both of them dismissed uh, uh, closing this continually, perpetually through drawing down savings. So that brings it back to current Alaskans. And the real question is, what's the best approach to raise the revenue? Since we're going to continue to have these deficits, what's the best approach to raising revenue uh, uh, to, to, to close those deficits? People immediately want to jump to the PFD, the top 20%. Right. Immediately want to jump to the top to the PFD and say that's the way we need to close it because that has the the, the the smallest impact on them. But that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is consider the impact on the economy, consider the impact on Alaskans overall, and that's what Senator Key on Senator Shower's conversation was about. I think I think it's a great conversation. This is paying dividends. Is that right? That's the name of the the podcast. Uh, it's the PFD debate. Uh, it's Talk of Alaska, the Talk of Alaska uh, segment of of um, of, uh, uh, of uh, the Alaska Public uh, website, uh, and it's uh, the title is the PFD debate, uh, June twenty eighth. I can send you to the link in the chat room. Okay, here, yeah, uh, I just quick. I just linked the wrong thing, so I'll uh, I'll be looking for it here, and we'll uh, we'll we'll look at that here. Talk of Alaska. I'll see if we can find the link and post it up in the chat room brad we're i mean we're, we're down to this this last week here um like you said i mean this could be kind of just a wasted week as we basically bloviate back and forth on both sides i mean where do we where do we where do we go on this where what do we do um I, I, this week isn't going to resolve it michael i mean we're going to have we're going to have uh the, the override the vetoes aren't going to be overridden the vetoes are going to stand but then people are going to talk about supplemental funding in the capital budget as Lyman said both the House and the Senate are going to vote at least the Juno factions are going to vote for 1600 PFD 1600 dollars PFDs the governor's going to veto them and send them back we're going to be at this at least for another month I think the real hard deadline there's two hard deadlines one's going to be getting the the, the state portion of the transportation segment of the capital uh, budget uh, done, and that's only that's less than $100 million, but getting that done so that we don't lose the opportunity for the billion dollars in federal funding uh, that we get from the transportation budget, that, that hard deadline's at the end of July. The next hard deadline, frankly, is at the end of, of August, the 1st of September, which is when, when we really need to know what the PFD number is going to be. 
And frankly, just like happens in D.C., I think this is going to stretch out to those two deadlines. I don't, I don't, I don't see any movement by either side in advance of being under the pressure of those deadlines. So I, I think we're going to be at this for uh, quite a while longer. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, and, and I, I was afraid of this when we watch this as this PFD becomes a political hot potato. Reason number 385 why it needs to go into the uh, Constitution as the correct original formula, uh, simply just to eliminate this discussion. Yep. Uh, we, we will wish it, it had ended. We wish it would ended, have it ended long before now, but there's just not going to be – once once Pruitt said we can use the capital budget to restore spending, there's just not going to be any end of this. We're just going to roll all of this, all of this energy that people have put into uh, uh, reversing the vetoes uh, once they aren't reversed, we're just going to roll all of that energy into supplementing the capital budget, uh, and it's just going to keep on going. Uh, final thoughts here, Brad. What could people do to try and help bolster this and keep it rolling? Got about 90 seconds here. Stay in touch with your legislators. The legislators who are going to vote to uphold the PFDs need to know that you have their backs, uh, that there's people out there that, that, that want them to take that stand. Stay in touch with them. <laughs> keep the emails, the text messages, the calls going. Tell them you have their backs on that issue uh, because that's where the battle is going to be fought now for the next uh, next couple of months. Stay, stay with them. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you, uh, appreciate you continuing to join us here as we go through this. Thank you so much. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three. <laughs>